This is an episode of Unconfined, a podcast of the Johns Hopkins Center for a Livable Future in Baltimore, Maryland. You can find us online at clf.jhsph.edu. Mike Milley is our sound engineer and produced our theme music. Your hosts are me, Tom Philpot, and Christine Grillo. Paulette Wilson is a producer, and Natalie Wood Wright is the executive producer. The opinions expressed here are not necessarily those of Johns Hopkins University or of the Center for a Livable Future. Okay, welcome everyone to Unconfined Podcast. We're very excited for this week's guest. Her name is Magali Licoli. She is the executive director of Venceremos, which is a workers group in Springdale, Arkansas. Um, not, con- not coincidentally, um, also that town of Springdale is a global headquarters of Tyson Food. Uh, which is one of the big world's biggest meat companies and a dominant producer of of poultry here in the United States. Uh, we're very excited to have you on, Magali. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Tom, for inviting me. Of course. Um, now, I wonder if you would talk a little bit about the situation just generally with poultry workers in your area. Um, now, I noticed that uh, most poultry workers who who are able to organize are involved with a workers center and not a union. Um, can you first talk a little bit about the challenges of forming unions in a right to work state like Arkansas? Yes, well, you know, I've been uh, trying or I've been organizing or I got into the uh, labor movement since 2014. And through those years of uh, advocating for poultry workers and learning about the dynamics between the corporations and the government of the state of Arkansas, you know, learning that uh, cozy relationship they have and why the unions are not as strong, uh, I've been learning that obviously uh, Arkansas is not only a right to work state, but it's a corporate state where it's primarily dominant by Walmart, Tyson Foods, and JB Hunt. Um, so, you know, uh, in the years connecting with workers, learning about what the unions are doing, I c- became aware of like the distrust that workers have over the unions, because in the South, the unions are weak, they don't have strong contracts. And and really, since 2016, when I was uh, mobilizing the community and poultry workers, uh, we saw that the workers didn't trust the union. Uh, They didn't trust the union because uh, in Arkansas, first of all, there is only one unionized plant, which is in Dardanelle, Arkansas, which is like two hours south from where we are. And connecting through those workers uh, and just learning the lack of support they receive through the union. Uh, Many of them are unaware of why they became union members. Many of them were unaware of like where the union was or where it stand. And so to me, obviously, organizing poultry workers, it's also about building trust and connecting to really what they don't trust and why, learning why they distrust OSHA, they distrust the union. And it's really because it hasn't, for the poultry workers is not sufficient, you know, it's not enough what they do for workers. And and we know that the union uh, is not interested in really expanding the union plans in Arkansas, like the, like for instance, Tyson's uh, plans, you know. And for me, uh, since the beginning of, of advocating for poultry workers, I've been more connected to workers from Tyson's plants. Uh, 
And so the union didn't want to expand uh, uh, the union into other Tyson plants. And so for us, it's been like, what is outside organizing outside the union or outside the worker centers? And it's been truly a journey of learning those things, you know, uh, for instance, also um, during the pandemic, uh, when the workers, the poultry workers were uh, more affected uh, because of the pandemic, because of the COVID. I was able to uh, connect with workers from that union plant in Dardanelle. They called me, uh, first of all, to thank us for what we were doing because we were mobilizing workers at the beginning of the pandemic. Our first protest against Tyson was on April of 2020 in regards of the lack of protections on PPE and everything, you know, that it, it had to do with the COVID. Uh, and so the, the, those workers called us to thank us for the work that we were doing and that they didn't have, the, that they haven't seen the union representatives during that time. And so it's just really the lack of, uh, the unions are not as strong and they don't have probably, uh, union representatives coming to the plant enough. The workers don't know about that. And I have already talked about that with the federal union. And it's just, you know, that the situation that it is right now. Uh, I also connected through the years of, uh, of doing this work with uh, workers from Texas that were also unionized and they were sharing about why the union was not as strong, was not there. And so for me, gaining the trust of workers, it means to really connect, to connect, to be connected to those struggles, right? And to know that for workers were, those were not the solutions. And so that's why we just began looking or seeking for new solutions to these problems. And I wonder, um, and I, I remember w when I first met you, it was right at the start of the pandemic in 2020, and I was working as a journalist, and I interviewed you, and um, you hooked me up with a with a worker at a plant in Arkansas who I interviewed, and then you also hooked me up with a, some workers in a plant in Texas. Uh, I think it might have been a different company, but they weren't, they were they were represented by the National Union, but were getting no no support or help. And it, it seems like there is a um, kind of a split between the the sort of South right to work states and the, and the Northern states where the union was great up in pork packing plants in the in the Midwest, really calling attention to problems, but not so great in poultry in the South. And I think that's to do with just this historic attack on unions uh, in the Southern United States. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the um, the conditions that workers at at the plants that you sort of uh, uh, work with, what sort of conditions do they face? I remember when I, I talked to you um, in 2020, one of the points that I really wanted to drive home was that we're get, putting a lot of attention on meatpacking workers right now because this pandemic is horrific. This virus is tearing through these plants. Workers are standing shoulder to shoulder. They're getting infected. They're bringing it home. There's no shortage of horror stories. But one of the things that I really wanted to drive home in this piece was that before the pandemic, things were also really bad. And that just gave the pandemic more opportunity to spread around. But I wonder if you could talk about things like repetitive stress injuries, um, about the um, the really strong smells that come out of the chemicals and um, and that whole issue, um, which obviously predates the pandemic. Yes, uh, I began uh, advocating for poultry workers in 2014 because I was working in a community clinic like a block far from one of the biggest Tyson's plant here in Springdale. And through that job, I was learning the issues that many of those workers were, were former workers that suffered injuries through that job. Like they had respiratory problems because they were exposed to chemical leaks. Uh, a lot of them had uh, carpal syndrome. They, they had surgeries in their hands, uh, some amputations. 
So I, you know, I was helping the, the, the workers to get into different programs in the community clinic offered because those workers didn't have any uh, health care. And so to me, it was shocking to know that many of those workers needed like high specialists. Uh, they had to spend like $600 on, on medicine to keep their treatments they needed for the rest of their lives. And so just learning that it was just not one case, two cases, three cases, it was multiple cases. It was a systemic issue going on. And so, and then I began learning more about the issues that they were facing. Uh, it was about the line speed, you know, uh, since those years, you know, we, the workers were struggling with the line speed that kept increasing over and over through the years that the USDA was allowing these plants to keep, uh, increasing the line speed, uh, that the chicken council was there to influence the federal government to pass this these regulations on increasing the line speed, um, that OSHA didn't have any set standards to prevent the plants to use high amounts of chemicals, that the only standard they have so far uh, is that they need to train the workers on what chemicals they use. Obviously, the plant don't, you don't even does that, but uh, it was the problem about the high amounts of chemicals they have to work with uh, through the day, like the um, the parasitic acid that it was used to clean the the the. The, the chicken, the areas, but it was like a huge amounts of that parasitic acid that didn't have really enough investigation of the long side effects on being exposed on that uh, uh, chemical. So before the pandemic, uh, we were uh, traveling to Washington, D.C. Uh, to talk to the USDA about why they should not allow the increase of line speed. We were talking to OSHA about the chemicals uh, and also about the line speed because between OSHA and the USDA, they keep blaming each other about this issue, but no one it really becomes responsible about setting really standard safety, safe standards on the line speed. So before the pandemic, when even before, uh, when we built Penseremos in 2019, uh, we were building a campaign about the chemicals because that was one of the huge issues that workers were struggling with. A lot of respiratory problems, a lot of people with asthma, and really how because it was really hard to even file the workers' comp cases because it was hard to prove that they develop asthma because they were exposed to high amounts of chemicals through the years. So uh, those, and also um, in 2016, 2017, we protest against, we did a protest against Tyson about the bathroom breaks because the workers were not allowed to uh, to walk to the bathroom enough, um, that workers were forced to wear diapers because they were not granted enough bathroom breaks. A lot of workers have diabetes, uh, women were pregnant, you know, and they have more biological needs than other workers. And they were just really forced to wear diapers to go through the day. And those things were like, you know, it, it was, it was bad. It, the situation was already bad. But obviously, as you mentioned with the pandemic, the workers were already facing horrible working conditions, uh, being, having to work shoulder to shoulder, it, pretty much acting like machines, you know, where they have to be cutting the, the chicken certain time of per minute and uh, certain time per minute, the repetitive injuries, you know, and so that obviously allowed that situation, the, what we saw, uh, that many workers were dying, many workers were getting sick, and how the industry really used the pandemic to take advantage to make more profits. You know, that they use this idea or this concept of uh, telling the workers they were essential. Of course, they always been essential, but they use that politically to force the workers to remain working uh, to save the countries, uh, the countries uh, from going uh, on, on crisis on food. 
So actually, Tyson was telling the workers every day, you're a, a hero, you're essential. Without you, without your work, people wouldn't be able to eat. And so while workers were exposed to get sick and die every day. So uh, we saw how these companies like Tyson make record profits during that year of 2020. And obviously, the situation helped only to expose the issues the situations of, of poultry workers, but this the the problems had continued even after the pandemic or the most horrible years of the pandemic. The situation has become even worse for workers. Yeah, you've told me before about one of the things that happened with the pandemic was that you know obviously. Um, a non, you know, a, a substantial number of workers died. So literally, uh, staffing goes down that way, um, and the job was just so unpleasant and scary that uh, there were staffing challenges in these plants. And the staffing challenges, the companies w- would just increase the load on the existing workers. They didn't want to slow their plant down, uh, lower production. Um, and where are we that with that today? Um, you know, what are you observing in terms of are, are staffing levels back up to normal? Um, and, you know, I, I, as the second part of the question, I want to ask, um, has there been any progress on the um, repetitive motion industry uh, injuries, the um, just the really exposure to really strong smelling chemicals all the time? Have there been any, has there been any progress on those issues? Well, uh, not really. Uh, the situation uh, hasn't, uh, has become worse because, Obviously, uh, during the pandemic, we saw that uh, the crisis of workers getting sick and died. A lot of workers were not able to return to work because they got the long COVID. They were uh, now on on getting on disabilities. Uh, many workers just quit working because they had uh, their families died. Uh, because a lot of the families work in the same company, you know, the, the dad, the mom, or their uh, siblings, you know, the family works on the same companies. So a lot of people quit working in that com- in the companies like Tyson or other smaller companies. And then we saw that crisis of absenteeism, you know, that uh, many workers had to still to keep up with the production. The production has never decreased, you know. The company has been always been able to to force the production with the with the workers that are there. And now um, then we saw how the companies were desperate and advertising better salaries. You know, uh, before the pandemic, an average uh, poultry workers was making around twelve dollars an hour, and then in twenty twenty one, we saw that the companies were uh, telling the people, um, announcing that they were going to be pay uh, fifteen dollars an hour. But that also uh, was an issue for the former, for the old workers were that were working at for the company for over twenty years, fifteen years, and making a still. 12, 13 dollars per hour. And they got upset because the new workers were going to be paid more. And that's why we also protest Tyson about this, uh, that they were just incentivizing workers to keep, to come to work. Whereas the old workers that were in the company for over 10 years, the companies, the company didn't really care about. And so, uh, we saw that happened, but also, I mean, the production was still in, in, in increased. Uh, let's remember that in April of 2020, the USDA allowed some companies to increase the line speed from 145 birds per minute to 174 birds per minute. And that were, that was to certain plants. But I always like to mention that because there is not standards, there is no regulation, there is not inspectors, the companies have always violated the line speed. You know, the workers have always experienced the increase of line speed because the machinery breakdowns and they they had to stop production and they have to, and then they have to recover that production after the machinery gets fixed. 
which allows the the company to increase the line speed to keep up with the production to not lose that you know the the minutes that they lose while they were fixing the machineries mm-hmm. uh so that happened um and obviously a lot of the workers who were exposed to continue working uh with higher uh line speed with less workers Right now, the injury rates had increased tremendously. I can tell you because I don't, we, we should not be absolute, but probably 99% of the workers are working while injured. Um, working with, uh, a lot of them have experienced more, uh, increase of, uh, carpetunal syndrome, amputations, and, And really the lack of resources they have after they get injured because they only have really two options or going to the doctors, the company's doctors, that they will tell them you don't have nothing. You have just to take Tylenol and go back to the line and just pretend that everything is okay with your health because you're okay. You know, it's just uh, to, to force workers to continue working while injured or to quit working, you know, and just being left with that injury for life without the company being responsible for that. So a uh, very few uh, workers pursued workers' comp because that also uh, brings a lot of retaliation. And then eventually the company will try to th- their ways to, to fire the workers um, and not really compensate them with good money. Um, here in Arkansas, it's really hard to find a lawyer that will really fight for those cases. Um, and so obviously, uh, the situation uh, has gotten worse because also right now that after the crisis that we are seeing on Tyson closing, shut, shutting down some plants, uh, allowing that production to go to another plant so the workers keep on that, uh, increasing the, the production. In all, we have seen increase of production in other plants. And, and so, and how really now the companies are trying to squeeze uh, less workers to do more of the production because they are desperate, because they they want to to continue making profits as they did in 2020. The chicken prices have have gone up, the meat prices have gone up. So they are just trying to really now squeeze the profits out of the shoulders of the workers. Uh, And so, so yeah, the situation right now has not become any better. Uh, They think uh, it's getting worse right now. Okay, well, this is a good point. So this is a very grim situation. Anyone who has talked to poultry workers or read the research knows that we're talking about a very serious, grim situation of workers being injured as a matter of course on the job. And um, there's actually, there's not been a whole lot of federal research about this, but um, I think around 2013, 2014, in that period, um, there were a couple of federal studies that came out of plants that were given permission years before these pilot plants to increase their line speed from 140 to 175 birds per minute. There are a couple of studies of those plants and the carpal tunnel syndrome rates of these two plants were off the charts. And not just carpal tunnel, but uh, various um, repetitive motion injuries. And, uh, and so, I mean, basically the reaction was, let's not look at that anymore because this is really, really scary. But I will put those two studies in the show notes. I've cited them a few times. And they are a small sample, but it's pretty much all we have. And they picked two plants, and what they found was pretty ugly. Um, Okay, so this is a grim situation. However, Venceremos is taking a novel approach, uh, at least within the poultry space, to organizing workers and gaining attention. And you at Venceremos are... Um, doing something that is called, or, you know, sort of working on something that's called the worker-driven social responsibility model. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and sort of how you're different from other worker centers. Yes. Uh, you know, uh, in whenever we were uh, 
part of a worker justice center before, the approach of the worker centers has always been more of so like case management, you know, helping workers to go through those cases of wage theft or uh, discrimination or sexual harassment cases or uh, workers' comp and, you know, helping them to get resources. But when I began learning on how to organize workers and how to uh, you know, just more of learning about what was going on with the poultry industry and the poultry workers. To me, I mean, just taking cases is an easy thing to do, probably, because you just help them. But that those things don't get, I mean, the situation doesn't get resolved. You know, the systemic problems don't get resolved through fixing one case, one, one case. So because of the, the high need, you know, the, the horrible working conditions that these workers are exposed every day to me and to the workers who were just seeing that, uh, that OSHA was not a, a solution to the workers, you know, that the USDA was pretty much acting against the workers, that we saw, we have seen the decrease of uh, USDA inspectors since the Trump administration, you know, that we have seen the decrease of uh, funding to OSHA since the last years. And it's just pretty much you doing that advocacy work or trying to implement policies. It's been, uh, um, it hasn't taken us anywhere, right? Because the government uh, keep changing the administration from Republicans, Democrats, and we keep, you know, fighting this. And then the next year we fight it that again. And then we lose it in the next administration. We, we needed to learn more about what is a concrete solution, you know, um, and learning from others that have been on the road fighting for workers' rights since decades. Uh, so for us, it was crucial to learn other models of organizing because we really wanted to tackle the issues for, I mean, to change systemically the problems of what the workers were facing. And me as a leader advocating for workers, I would not be the one that brings OSHA as a solution, right? Because if the workers don't trust that, I would not be the one that just keeps telling them, you need to trust the current uh, institutions. You know, we need to just keep fighting on that because the workers have lost hope. And so for us, was for me as a, as a leader and for the workers who were with me back then was a journey of like, what, what are the, what are concrete solutions? So for us it was crucial to learn from the farm workers who bend on the ground fighting for workers since like, decades ago. So that's why um, we were very curious about what the the workers in Florida, the farm workers in Florida were doing and learning about the fair food program, what it was, uh, because when we traveled the first time in 2019, 2018, I'm sorry, we didn't really know much about what was the fair food program, how it worked. Uh, the components of the program. We didn't really know that, but when we traveled and we learned from them directly, we saw, we went to the fields and saw how they were enforcing the fair food program and the rights of workers under this program and, and being, and seeing how the workers were speaking up against the employer if they didn't follow through the, their, the rights under the fair food program. It was really powerful. And we began traveling with workers. The coalition of Imokali uh, traveled to Arkansas to meet with workers. And it was then when we pretty much like, you know, for us, it made all the sense to reinforce the rights of workers through the market. Because at the end of the day, what these companies care about are those contracts, are those profits, you know. And if we can force the supply chain 
to reinforce or set standards of how workers should be treated, you know, because we always hear, you know, that, for example, now with the child labor, you know, that is going on within the supply chain of Tyson and many poultry companies and how these companies keep saying we are not uh, we are not responsible for those people because we are not hiring directly. But this is about what is is a moral thing to do. Right. That the company should have that uh, social responsibility to protect the workers' rights through the whole supply chain, not only the workers that they hire directly, but to assure that those rights land through the through the whole workers that work within their supply chain. So for us, that was um, an approach that we saw as a solution, you know, and to bring people to believe in that, to land that program in poultry, obviously it comes with challenges because obviously uh, the expansion of the WSR has been successful in the dairy industry, as we are seeing with the workers in Vermont, uh, with the workers in, uh, in the textile industry in Bangladesh. But to really now bring that model to poultry, it's also will be a journey of assuring or bringing the people that want to see a systemic change in the poultry industry to help us to land that program too here in, in poultry. Uh, and so obviously we are a grassroots organization. We began uh, meeting in a church. Now we have a, an office. Uh, we are growing our worker base. We are continue. We continue uh, mobilizing the community, you know, and that's, I think, one of the most powerful things that we have seen by changing the approach, you know, that before workers will come to a worker center and hope that the worker center or the people there will bring the solution to them, you know, their case. But now we are telling the workers, you are part of the solution. We need you here to fight with us because you are part of that solution and you are part of making those changes to empower the community, you know, it has been, um, has been rewarding, you know, to see that shipment and how workers now are perceiving Benceremos as an organization where they can come and fight. They can come and speak up about what's really going on. They can come and to hold the company accountable because Tyson has so much respect in this community because they are based in Springdale and it's pre evil how they operate to control the communities, to keep them silenced, you know, by providing charities, by creating programs for our communities, by sponsor every single event, a community event we have in Springdale. It brings that fake uh, respect of a corporation that is really destroying the well-being of our communities. And so I think also to be able to shift that narrative in the community, you know, that yes, Tyson is providing jobs, is providing charity, but what ultimately we want is justice for workers that is not going to be provided by a charity of 20 or $10,000, right? But it's going to be provided by the company really assuring the rights of workers so that the workers don't, don't get injured. So one day the workers are not struggling to find a job or struggling to find health care. So that's ultimately what we want, you know, to eradicate that cycle of poverty that keeps on going and going in these communities. And just to, um, to put a, a point on the sort of coalition of Immokalee workers example in Immokalee, Florida, which is the center of tomato production, winter tomato production in the United States. Um, you know, what CIW did was they said, you know, we've been struggling against these growers for decades. They're not increasing wages. They're not making conditions better. Um, and we, we can't really form a union because we're in Florida and it's really hard to form a union down here. And so they went to the companies that buy the tomatoes. So they went to McDonald's and Burger King and 
um, Walmart and Whole Foods and all the, the sort of big buyers of these tomatoes. And they, um, you know, uh, perform uh, boycotts, uh, especially on college campuses, but even apart from college campuses, and got these companies to agree to pay um, everyone, you know, it's famous that so they got everyone to pay an extra penny a pound to sign the fair food agreement, pay an extra penny a pound. But the thing that doesn't get nearly enough um, publicity is that they also created a worker created code of conduct that you can't abuse workers in the field. You can't scream at them. You can't insult them. Uh, sexual harassment in the field was pervasive. A lot of women work in this industry. Um, you can't do that anymore. And like you were saying, they have come up with their own enforcement mechanisms that hold the growers accountable and really change things in Amakali. And now other, you know, workers in other areas that are also um, mistreated, um, as a matter of course, are now taking note. And Vincent Amos is one of them. And Magali, we um, got to hang out in Amakali um, two years ago or so uh, for a story I did. Um, and, um, and, you know, one thing that the Immokalee story teaches us is that to, to create that, they work for decades. And I think a lot of what you're talking about is gaining the trust of workers because you're, you have workers who are pretty isolated, um, who don't trust, you know, the federal agencies like OSHA that are supposed to be uh, overseeing worker safety. They don't trust the USDA inspectors who come in. Um, the union, that, as much as it exists, which is not which which is not very much in Arkansas, uh, they don't trust the union very much, and so you're dealing with these workers who just are in a foreign country, maybe don't speak the language, and don't have a lot of trust in these institutions, and you're having to build that trust. And um, you know, can we ask how how is that going? Like, where are you in that process? Well, as I said, I mean, it's a process because it it these changes don't come from top to bottom, right? It comes from bottom up. So in order to create that change, uh, you need to create a worker base. You need to bring more workers. You need to mobilize the community uh, to educate the community about the WSR. What What is that? You know, so we are um, right now in the process, obviously, for us has been a process to even... To, bring uh to create our office to you know to establish our office uh to bring more staff um now we have uh hired workers to become uh, organizers that will help us to bring more workers uh so we are on the process of really uh connecting to workers not only from the Tyson plants but connecting workers from other smaller plants across the state of Arkansas. Right now, we have um, we have created uh, some workers uh, that in that are trying to organize other workers in Green Forest, which is an hour east from Springdale. And now we are wor working on growing a worker base in Van Buren, um, which is an, an hour south. Uh, the Van Buren workers went on a strike. Um, of uh, in April of this year because the Tyson plants was shutting down with leaving the workers without any compensations or anything. And so right now those workers went to work to other smaller plants that are facing bigger issues or other issues. And, and so we are trying now to establish a worker base there to kind of help mobilize the workers, you know, because in order to build that program or to, to bring that program that is uh, worker driven, that workers are part of the solution, you need to establish that connection to the workers directly. You need to grow uh, the worker bases to be connected to the workers because ultimately uh, to create a code of conduct, you need the workers' voices to be put into that code of conduct. It's not going to be Magali or academics writing that code of conduct because this is what we believe in, right? Is the workers that ultimately are they have the experience working directly in those plans. And obviously they know the solutions because if you're working every day, you see the problems, but you also know the solutions, right? To those problems that often obviously the company don't hear about. 
but that's where we are. We are growing. We are uh, continue uh, mobilizing the community because I believe that is just uh, a matter of like building up, right? The movement doesn't create just by one protest or two. It cre- it, it's, it's built through the years of connecting and getting that trust from workers. Even decades. Um, I mean, it's it's a it's a long process. Now, one of the um, the issues that has I'm sure been around for a while, but is now coming to light, is that um, we've we have seen incredible journalism. There's a great piece by um, a journalist named Hannah Dreyer, the New York Times Magazine, it came out about a month ago. You're actually quoted in the piece about this issue of these big poultry companies, and Tyson is named prominently in the article, uh, these big poultry companies um, outsourcing the task of cleaning up the facility after the shift. And you can imagine when you're talking about 140 to 175 chickens coming down the pike per minute. Is it really per minute? Per hour? Per minute. Per minute, per minute. It's just, uh, it's just stunning. When you have a line running at that speed for, you know, hours and hours on end, you can imagine that there's a big mess to clean up at the end of the day. And the companies, um, you know, made the decision to, to outsource this to these contractor companies who will come in and clean up your facility, their entire businesses that are devoted to that. And these businesses are literally using child labor, 14-year-olds, 15-year-olds, of there have been some hor- horrific injuries. Um, it's basically sacrificing kids' education, um, taking advantage of um, of people um, migrating and from desperate situations. Uh, you know, economies in Central America, Mexico, South of Central in Central America and Point South were absolutely devastated by the pandemic. Um, there's climate change issues uh, that are pushing people out, out of agriculture. There's a long tail of U.S. influence in that area that it has made people, very, you know, things very difficult. So we're seeing this, um, these inf- this influx of people coming north, uh, many of them children, many of them relied on by their families to make money. And these companies are taking advantage uh, by hiring them. And we're seeing horrific um, injuries. Can you talk a little bit about, um, well, first of all, I, I just can't get my head around it. The governor of your state, um, the, the fine um, Sarah Huckabee Sanders, uh, signed a law uh, recently making it easier to hire um, child labor um, in Arkansas. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and and you know how Ben Seremos is responding to this uh, to this challenge? Yeah, I mean uh, those kids were found cleaning those facilities, and just think about like. Really, when I talk to the workers, uh, like, for example, the mechanics that work to fix the machinery when they get broken through the shift, they have always said that those machineries, uh, the machines are pretty old, uh, that they are really like they're breaking down every time and that which makes it very pretty dangerous for workers, you know, to work with a machine that it's, it's just pretty old. Uh, so imagine a kid having to work and to clean through that machinery every day. I mean, we just recently learned about the kid being killed uh, in Mississippi uh, for cleaning that type of machinery. Uh, so obviously uh, the companies, uh, they've been outsourcing these type of jobs uh, many years ago. Uh, for a reason, obviously, because it's it's a dangerous job to do. But with the crisis of the industry, uh, that they were like desperate of looking for new workers. At some point, uh, and I will just be honest, at some point in 2021, when we saw the absenteeism and how they were just being desperate about getting new workers, I thought like it was coma- it was going to be something like the government was going to allow immigrants to come easily or it was going to be more refugees. It, w- it had to be like a force of vulnerable workers coming to this industry because they need vulnerable workers to exploit them, you know. 
um, they can't hire a worker that knows fully their rights that can speak up because obviously uh, they they would be able to change everything, right? So they need people that are afraid to speak up, that are just afraid of losing those jobs. So, but I never imagined that their answer to that crisis was to bring more kids. And so when we learned about this um investigation by the Department of Labor that was released this year. Soon after that, the governor of Arkansas passed this uh, law, the rollback on uh, child labor laws. And obviously, uh, it was to protect the poultry industry in Arkansas because they knew that it was not only kids working in the cleaning facility. Right now, and what I hear through the workers, because I also helped a group of catchers. Catchers are the workers that work in the chicken farms that are, uh, are um, their job is to catch the bird alive, put it into cages and tr- so that it can be transported to processing plants. So that job, it's even, even worse, you know, um, the majority of those workers are are immigrant, undocumented. Uh, they are afraid to speak up about the, the, the conditions or the employer because those jobs are also through uh, contractors. You know, the companies pay the contractor so that the contractor creates this group of catchers of people that will be able to do that job. Uh, last year, uh, I helped a group of catchers that came to to Venceremos because the the contractor didn't want to pay them because they, they were forced to work 16 hours straight. In that group of catchers, there were two minors. I saw them and they looked like 14 years old, like pretty young. Uh, and and actually, when they came to Venceremos, they were sleeping while they were the others were talking about what was happening and what was the problem. And I just asked them, like, how old are these kids? And they didn't want to tell me until they told me that they were like 14 years old. They were um, they are uh, indigenous from Guatemala that are that came to work to Arkansas or they were brought to work to Arkansas to catch the birds. So it was this moment of like learning that there were more kids coming to work in the chicken farms and then kids were found in the cleaning facilities and then eventually the governor passed this law. It was to protect the poultry industry in Arkansas because they were bringing more kids to work in this industry. So what I've heard through the workers, it was that more kids are coming uh, with an asylum status. Uh, the majority of those kids are indigenous from Central America. They are being brought from Mississippi, from Alabama to do these jobs. So we have seen an increase of those kids working in the chicken farms. And obviously there is no investigation yet of what's going on, but that's what we have heard that most kids are coming to more than to work in the chicken plant. So that's why I'm trying to, to, to connect more to those workers so that they can speak up about that about what they see, but it's been like really months of building that relationship, that trust, because they are truly terrified. Even if we tell them we are going to protect your identity, uh, they are still afraid because they are hired directly by the contractor that sometimes abuse them verbally, physically. So many of them are, if have even told me that they're be afraid of being killed if they speak up because that's how they are being treated uh, with uh, verbal abuse, with physical abuse. And so imagine kids being treated that way is obviously uh, more terrifying for those kids to speak up. Some of them, a lot of them come without their parents So that's why it makes sense for the state of Arkansas to get rid of that permission so that these kids are being hired uh, without any problems. 
And I guess the, you know, the official response from the big companies like Tyson is, oh, well, um, that's terrible. We're sorry to hear about that, but that's not a responsibility because they don't work for us. Right. But that's when you start talking about their supply chain and the responsibility yes, yes. they have to assure a dignity uh, through all the holder supply chain. Because Tyson is a, a huge company in Arkansas, obviously in the U.S., but they always uh, say that they are a family uh, business. They have strong family values. So they need to protect the values of the families of the workers that they work, not only in their plants, but also within their supply chain. So, Magali, as we wrap, um, I wonder if we could talk a little bit about how consumers can ultimately, I know maybe we're not at that point yet, play a role, but, you know, starting about 15 years ago, the CIW, the Coalition of Immokalee Workers, made an ask. They said, you know, we're targeting Burger King. Um, don't go to Burger King um, until they sign this. And that was having an impact on college campuses where these fast food restaurants were really, um, you know, prevalent. And there were these really strong boycotts in college campuses. There were loads of articles that made the companies look bad. And one after the other, almost all the companies, I think Wendy's is still holding out, but most of the companies sign these packs and we've seen actual change on the ground in um in tomato country um when like what is there something that consumers can do now and what do you perceive as the future role of consumers in this um in this movement well obviously consumers have a huge power you know to change companies practices because at the end of the day, they are the big buyers of the products you know without the consumers there is no profits. And so I think ultimately the work is to continue talking about uh, the struggles of poultry workers uh, so that people are aware of what's happening because a lot of people don't even know the the problems so what these workers face every day. A lot of people don't even know that they have a power to change that, you know. So for us, you know, it's been always like going to the universities, connecting to the students, connecting to people in all the ways possible to really uh, make them aware that this fight is not only an issue that workers need to need, need to fix themselves, you know. I always say you, you should not think this is just only the problem of workers. It's the problem that we all have to change because we are all responsible of changing those things. You know, let's remember when we began seeing videos of how the animals were, was, were being slaughtered, how the animals were being treated, and how people got so mad about seeing how the animals were treated that demanded uh, mercy for animals, right? That demanded better treatment for animals because they were exposed to that information. So the same thing goes for workers. You know, if we are uh, terrified about how the animals are being treated, we should even be more terrified about how the workers are being treated and demand that these companies treat their workers fairly and with dignity uh, because Beyond that, these workers are people of color. Beyond that, these workers are immigrant. They are ultimately the workers that work to bring, uh, bring us food to our table. So we should be able to stand up with the workers to demand, uh, human rights for workers. And so, uh, yes, the worker, the, the consumers have a lot of power and responsibility to change those conditions for workers as well. Well, Magali, is there anything else you want to add? Mm, no. <laughs> well, listen, thank you so much for taking the time. Um, you know, if you, if I'm um, speaking to the viewer, to the listeners now, if you Google M Magali Lacoli's name, you will see her. She is a tireless, she's in lots and lots of great articles because journalists know and trust her. 
to give us the, the straight dope on what's happening on the ground in poultry country. And we really appreciate your work. And thank you so much for being our guest today on Unconfined Podcast. Thank you so much for the opportunity. This is an episode of Unconfined, a podcast of the Johns Hopkins Center for a Livable Future in Baltimore, Maryland. You can find us online at clf.jhsph.edu.